welcome to this week's episode of the Good Ram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Okay, um, so this week it's Brooklady, but before we get on to that, I often get asked for, um, well, not necessarily recommendations, but I often get asked, you know, can you do an episode of the show on X, Y and Z, um, you know, requests for certain things, and if possible I certainly uh, give that a try, but um, the last request I had um, hello Jen, uh, oh, a little while ago was, we want to see your pussy cat. So, this is the pussy cat. This is, this is Barbie. Um, say hello Barbie. Um, this is my partner Julia's old cat. Um, obviously, I had nothing at all to do with the naming of said pussy cat because if it had been down to me, it should have been called something like Azraphel or, you know, something of, uh, of equal mythology of some form or description, but unfortunately, no, I had nothing, uh, nothing to do with the naming, and thus she is called Barbie. Anyway, so that's the cat. <laughs> okay, go on in. Um, so, right, <laughs> back to whiskey matters. Um, yeah, so Brooklady, I mean, there's, I don't need any reason to, uh, to, to do an episode of the show on, on Brooklady. I mean, I mean, Brooklady, go way back as you well know and I've done several episodes of the show on their whiskey in the past and yeah I, I've just always had a soft spot a, a real love for, for the, the whiskey that the distillery produces and I mean as you well know and I've probably mentioned uh, uh, before um, 15 years ago I was fortunate enough to spend a week working up there when I knew an awful lot less than I do now shall we say um, and it was you know a, a definite experience and you know the the thing is, as you well know, I have not strong strong views on on Brookladdin because um, I love the, the, the distillery that much. It's sort of you know been probably their their, their, their biggest um, fan, possibly um, or certainly uh, you know. Well, sold the whiskey and you know promoted it I've also been highly critical when I think bottlings weren't really up to the, the high standards that the distillery had and as I've probably said in the past I the whole concept of the the, the classic laddie um, doesn't sort of class the, the whole classic thing doesn't mean the same to um, Adam Hamlet the current uh, head distiller and myself I mean classic Brooklady to me was pretty much all American oak age, maybe a little bit of sherry, uh, but that wonderful aromatic honeysuckle, um, fresh, vibrant character which I remember from, from years ago. And I guess part of the issue is the, the legacy of the Murray McDavid years, the experimentations with different uh, different casks means that now there's this huge inventory of weird and wonderful casks that needs to be used, I guess. I mean, I don't know whether they're still filling uh, into wine casks and things like that. I don't know whether Adam sort of like, you know, has bought into that whole ex-philosophy, should we say, of uh, chucking everything into an ex-wine cask. But um, certainly, you know, he's got a, a, a number of these casks and needs to do things with them, which is why the classic features a number of different cask types and is no longer, in my personal opinion, classic Brooklady. I mean, it's maybe modern classic Brooklady, I suppose you could argue, but I think if you want the classic characteristics, then you have to look at the Isle of Barley, which is, of course, what we'll be doing today. And why am I looking at Brooklady? Because the current owners, Remy Contro, in their infinite wisdom and generosity, sent kindly sent me samples for today's show, including the ridiculously expensive rare cask bottlings that they have done, which we will get onto when I introduce the range. But so a big, big thank you to Remy Contro for their incredible generosity, and um, hopefully you know you'll, you'll enjoy this episode of the show. Because I mean, come on, this is Brooklady. You know, I'm not going to say anything bad about Brooklady now, am I? So. Uh, anyway, that's that's enough kind of waffle, I think. Um, so let's have a look at today's lineup. Right. Okay. So we're going to kick off with the eponymously named classic laddie, the Scottish barley, um, and uh, this, like I said, is a is a vatting of a number of different casks, including first and second fill American oak. Um, and various wine casks, red and white Reeve Sal, uh, Ribeiro del Duero and Pomerol. So, like I said, 
modern classic, maybe, uh, certainly not not classic in uh, what I would consider the, the, the use of the term classic, but of course obviously um, the reality is it's what's in the bottle or what's in the glass as the case may be, the cans. Um, so the second bottling we'll be looking at is the current release of the Isle of Barley, this is the 2010, it's six years old, bottled at 50%, and uh, it's um, comes from a number of uh, farms on Isla, including Cool. Uh, now, I will, my pronunciation is probably going to be horrible, so really, you know, hopefully I'm not going to offend anyone. Cool, Cruash, uh, Dunlossit, Island, Melindry, Rockside, Starch Mill, and Sunderland. And I always thought Sunderland was in the north of England, but apparently that is indeed a farm on Isla. So that's what makes up uh, the current Isla Bali. And uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, it's all American oak aged because the whole concept is Toir, as we've been through in the past in an episode of the show on the, the, the whole Toir thing. So we don't really need to get into that. But anyway, so I'm expecting that to be more classic in inverted commas brookladdy as opposed to the classic if you see what i mean then we're going to have a look at the three releases in the rare cask series or what they're called a rare cask series the first one is um uh called bourbon all in um and uh, was distilled in 1984 it's 32 years old bottled at 43.7 percent um apparently this was the last 12 casks from that year and it spent 24 years in a combination of refill bourbon hoggies and barrels before Jim McEwen recasked it in 2008 uh, into first fill bourbon and uh, there it spent further nine years now the cynics might say why would he put that into fresh bourbon barrels is it possibly because these barrels were a bit crappy and didn't really have any impart any kind of character which is partly possible i suppose i mean certainly um when the uh, when murray mcdavid bought the distillery that it certainly was a case of a number of the casks were in pretty poor shape and needed uh, recasking um although this was recast a number of years after the uh the event so but you know and spent nine years in the cask i mean well you know and um it's all a case of you know let's look at what uh, what it's about rather than uh, making up our minds before we've tasted it second bottling we'll be looking at is uh, from 1985 again 32 years old bottle of 48.7 and they've called it bourbon hidden glory now apparently this was the last 22 casks from 1985 and uh, it spent uh, 27 years or they spent 27 years in third fill bourbon hoggies and barrels before being recast in 2012 into first fill bourbon and then in 2017 uh, it was finished in um, uh, ex claret casks for three months so yeah, the wine doesn't seem to have played much of an impact uh, on the colour so we'll see how much of an impact it has made upon the actual spirit itself and the last of the three in the rare cast series is uh, uh, called Sherry the Magnificent Seven and the reason for the name is because it's the last seven casks from 1986 when it was first distilled so bottled um, uh, at 30 years of age at 44.6% Spent 26 years in ex Oloroso butts before being recast in 2012 into first fill Pedro Ximenez casks. So spent four years in those casks, which apparently came from Bodegas Fernando de Castilla, which uh, I think they bought a number of butts from, from there. I've seen that name crop up on uh, more than one occasion. And finally, we're going to end with a bit of peat, and why not? So the last bottling we'll be looking at is this one. It is the Port Charlotte bottle of 50% and uh, this is all again Scottish barley peated to 40 parts per million now um, you can type in the, the little code on the bottom now into the uh, the website to find out the recipe for said bottle uh, which I duly did and it didn't recognize it so I've got no idea what uh, what's in it I would imagine again it's going to be a combination of first and refill American oak possibly more refill America there's probably some sherry in it and there may well be some wine casks and again it's 
modern, modern Port Charlotte. I mean, I remember sort of first tasting Port Charlotte, it was all American oak aged and it was stunning stuff. So, anyway, um, that's this week's episode uh, of the show. This is the lineup, and um, let's get tasting some whiskey, shall we? Right, okay, so let's kick off with the classic. Let's see what the nose gives us on this. Quite dense, quite malty. Um, coffee, a little bit of spicy red fruit. It's a bit of barley as well. I mean, this is not sort of like, you know, uh, swamped by the, uh, the, the different cask types. It has to be said, there's a little bit of everything. Which is why it, it doesn't sort of say classic to me, if you see what I mean. Modern classic, like I've said, um, because this is, you know, being drawn from the, the current stocks that uh, the distillery has. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's still a lovely spirit. I mean, it's certainly got that lovely coastal saltiness. It's not quite got the sort of hyacinthy sort of um, honeysuckle kind of character that I remember, but then that's kind of mainly down to I think sort of like the, the influence of the wine casks it's certainly a sort of sort of grapey kind of whiny note which starts to come more uh, prevalent as you sort of uh, knows it and um, you yeah, know there's, there's going to be a number of, of, of customers that, that buy classic Brooklady that have never tasted you know cl classic Brooklady from sort of 15 odd years ago when you know it was classic and um I would just love to see them sort of re-release a sort of like a 10 year old or something like that all American oak um but you know maybe they will maybe they won't um but coming back to this particular bottling it's not bad and you know judging it on its own merits it's certainly a very very good whiskey um like I said I just can't <laughs> I just got the classic Brooklady forever burnt into my my, my sort of like uh, mental tasting notes of uh, whiskey. But anyway, let's see what the parts like. Malty. Dense, quite barley, lots of toffee oak to sort of kick off with. Then coming in with the spicy, winey fruits, um, salt, coffee, dark chocolate. Again, it's not classic Brooklady, but it is a very good whiskey. It's got a lovely progression. Um, yeah, really quite a chocolatey aftertaste in actual fact. It's it's a lot more robust. I remember. <laughs> Again, going back to say the old ten-year-old, I remember it being quite lighter, um, not more elegant. That's probably the wrong the wrong word, but it was it was more delicate, I should say, more aromatic, more floral, more barleyed, um, less dense. Um, and it's just the way of these things, isn't it? At, at the end of the day, and um, you know. I keep on saying that what you should do when you taste whiskey is evaluate what's in the glass. And so by purely doing that, I think this is still a very, very good whiskey. It just goes to show that the spirit that's been produced at the distillery is still absolutely top quality, but it's just not classic. Anyway, let's move on to uh, the uh, Isla Bali then. Um, I feel like bloody Jeremy Clarkson sort of reviewing a, um, you know, Maserati and saying, yeah, it's really, really good, but, you know. Um, anyway, let's, let's see what the Isla Bali gives us. Closer in style to um, what I consider to be classic Brooklady, obviously barley led. Oilier and denser, it has to be said, a little bit more serially sort of character um, admittedly this is only six years old but there's an earthiness there's a slight sort of coffee note coming through from the oak but it's got a lovely purity it has to be said and although it is young it certainly doesn't sort of like smell as young as some of the previous um, Isla Bali bottlings which were sort of like really quite 
off the stilly. This is certainly seems to be showing none of that particular characteristic, and um, it's got it. Like I said, it's it's very very barley lead. It's very very rich. It's robust. There's a little bit of of honeysuckle as a as a coastal note. So so like I said, if if you you're after sort of like the more classical um, Brooklady experience and the Isle of Bali is the one that I would um, recommend and that's the one that I stock. Um, you know, some subtle but toffee oak underneath. This is a lovely nose, really, really nice. I like this a lot. Let's see what the palace like. lighter, more delicate, elegant, again barley lead, a little drying on the finish um, which is probably more down to the alcohol and um, again a bit dusty, barley, touch of, touch of toffee, um, again really really nice, lovely coastal finish, um, I don't feel the salt almost kind of crystallising on the tongue and um, yeah, like I said, th this is more Brooklady as I remember it. It's probably like a bit more barley characters, a bit more robust, a little bit more oilier than um, Brooklady of old, but still, yeah, very, very good. Right, okay, so we're going to have a bit of a, a big jump in age statements from 6 to um, 32, but anyway, let's uh, see what the Bourbon All In is like then, shall we? That's a lovely nose. Subtly oaked. Um, there's a little bit of marzipan, a little bit of dusty vanilla. F mature fruit, there's a little bit of baked fruit, some barley, um, quite aromatic. Um, but, oh, that oak is lovely. And, and it doesn't feel forced, it doesn't like feel like it's been refreshed and I'm guessing you know nine years has, has been long enough to um, integrate the sort of like the fresher oak character into the overall whiskey and I think I think that's part of the issue with a lot of these casks uh, whiskies that have been you know put into sort of fresh casks for a short period of time there seems to be sometimes a disparity in, in the the oak character it sometimes feels forced it sometimes feels unintegrated this is certainly not the case Mm, touch of honey, sort of, um, orange conserve possibly, a little bit of lime, um, touch of apple blossom. I mean that is just absolutely stunning and I mean yeah for £700 a bottle you should bloody well hope so. Um, I mean this is just, just old Brocladi as I remember it, just elegant, gorgeous, deep. Mm, I can keep eulogising about this, it has to be said, this is absolutely stunning. Let's see what the palette's like. Mm, smooth, succulent, opens with the, the slightly marzipani vanilla oak. And then in comes the sort of the baked fruit, in comes apricot, orange conserve, salt, then comes back to the oak again on, on the finish, coming in with the vanilla and a little bit of white chocolate, um, salt, touch of peat smoke, just a just a, a little little bit. Um, oh but that's such a gorgeous mouthful. Um, that is a stunning whiskey, absolutely stunning. And um really well integrated and you know just 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 damn good okay so let's move on to the hidden glory then so this was um, the last 22 casts from 1985 which had a, a brief flirtation uh, with a claret cask so let's see what the note is slightly denser than the uh, the all-in 
a little bit more maltiness, uh, a little bit more coffee and toffee, a sort of slightly dark honeyed note. A little bit of, of, of winey red fruit, just kind of right there at the back. Um, softly spiced cinnamon, maybe. Touch of licorice. Touch of dried fruit. It's almost got a sort of a slight kind of sherry sort of uh, dried fruit note, but not quite. And um, hello, <laughs> pitch invasion. Um, that is frighteningly good. That is absolutely stunning. And that, that finish just gives it that little bit. And this was, I think, as I've often said with, with, with wine cask finished whiskies, you don't want it to be too heavy on the wine cask. You want just a, a nuance. And this certainly has just a little nuance. And it's just absolutely stunning. But then, like I said, you should hope so. It's 700 odd pounds a bottle. So. Mm, let's see what the palette's like. Palette is a bit drier, it's dustier, I'm certainly getting more tannins, I'm certainly getting more of the wine cask on the finish. And on the on the start as well, it has to be said, slightly chocolatey, sort of like spicy red fruits. Um, but again, underneath there's some baked fruit, there's some dark honey, salt. Mm, again, really salty, lovely salty finish, really cleansing. A um, little bit of little bit of citrus. Um, again, really well integrated, lovely balance. Possibly the palate is a little bit heavier on the wine cask um, but oh, still a fabulous whiskey absolutely gorgeous do you think so right okay so let's move on to the magnificent seven let's see what uh, this um big old sherry monster has got in store then shall we yes we'll see what's got in store Very grapey, very PX, winey, green nuts, herbal oloroso. It's a big, chunky, coffee, sherry nose. I mean, it's um, it, it's all sherry. I mean, you know, um, and there are going to be people that are going to sort of like fall over themselves for it. But for me, it lacks nuance and it's kind of... Um, Certainly nowhere in the same sort of complexity stakes as the, as the other two. Um, I mean, it's very clean. There's no sulphur, there's no off notes, no blemishes, but it's all sherry. Yeah, it's fine if you love sherry, but again, you know, apart from the sort of slight coastal kind of note uh, in, in the background, you, you know, you'd be hard pushed to sort of like say where this had come from which has always been my big argument with the, the, the use of sherry casks. But, yeah, there's a touch of raisins, a little bit of, of sort of raisinated fruitcake. Um, see what that's like. That's a juicy, raisinated, PX, whiny, sherry monster. Green nuts, herbal oloroso, a bit of dark chocolate, treacle. Lovely balance. The saltiness certainly balances it up. There's almost a bit of tail. No, um, there's almost a bit of um, bit of citrus in there. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you know, that is a big, big sherry monster, it has to be said. And, you know... Not personally my kind of cup of tea, but you know, really good, really blemish free. Yeah, what more can you Right, okay, so finally, let's move on to a bit of peat. Let's 
Let's see what Port Charlotte's giving us. Lovely kind of dusty, earthy peat. There's a little bit of medicinal notes. Barley, again, honey. I mean, the, the, the wonderful thing about the Port Charlotte is that it's not just a big peat monster, unlike Octomore. But, of course, Octomore, the um, key to Octomore is obviously the complexity within the peat characteristics. This is more kind of classically peated, I suppose. It's certainly got the, the barley, the sweetness of the fruit underneath, um, which kind of gives it a bit more of a, a two-dimension to it. Um, a little bit of chocolate, a little bit of oak, touch of dried fruit, possibly. Um, maybe there's a bit of sherry influence. Um, maybe a touch of perfume, sort of red fruit maybe as well. Maybe a little, there's a wine cask uh, in there as well. But certainly uh, it's, it's, it's a lovely nose, it's really impressive, lovely complexity. And uh, like I said, just really well balanced. Let's see what the palette's like. Quite barley. Got almost like a granulated sugar coating to the barley. A little bit of honey touch of medicinal peat, earthy peat, loam. Mm, oh, it's got quite an astringent, salty finish, really intense, um, mouth-wateringly so. Um, but again, lovely complexity, full, barley, rich, deep, lots of, um, of peat, but not too much, all really quite nicely balanced, really harmonious, and just a fabulous whiskey, it has to be said, you know, and this is what I love about um, moderately, well, moderate to high peated whiskies, you know, sometimes they can be just all about the peat, um, but certainly the, the, the Port Charlotte has got some lovely fruit beneath it, and uh, certainly more than just being, you know, one dimensional peat monster, so, mm, lovely way to finish. Right, okay, so that's some of this week's episode of the show up. Um, well, like I said, I mean, I've banged on enough about sort of what I think about the, the, the term classic, shall we say, but um, as I keep saying, it's all about evaluating what the liquid that's in the bottle, and the liquid in the bottle is good, you know, and um, I certainly wouldn't, you know, dissuade anyone from purchasing it because uh, it is a lovely drop, it has to be said. Um, if you want more of the classic uh, Brooklady kind of character, or certainly the classic character that I remember it, then obviously the Isla Barley is the one to go for. Um, it's more obviously Barley focused. It's, there seems to be less noise, less clutter, should we say? It's it's, it's kind of more focused, um, and it's a sort of to me it's a, a much purer um, expression of Brooklady than the the classic. Um, the uh, Bourbon All In, well, you know, just just stunning, absolutely stunning. I mean, uh, ticks all my boxes as far as, as Brooklady is concerned. And I've tasted a little, well, well, yeah, I've tasted a lot of old Brooklady, it has to be said. And that is certainly up there quality wise with, with um, you know, some of the best bottlings that I've tasted of, uh, of old Brooklady. Um, the Hidden Glory, yeah, okay, I kind of like that. I think it was nicely well balanced. The nose was very, very appealing. Maybe a little bit heavier on, on the wine cask on the palate, but um, still really complex, really interesting, and, you know, again, um, certainly, I think, worth worth the price tag. Um, the Magnificent Seven, never going to be my favourite style of whiskey, it has to be said. Uh, there's going to be people that love it. Personally, it was just too much sherry and not enough trousers, uh, as the case may be, and... Uh, um, but then what do you expect, you know, spending so many years in a sherry cask and then finish it in some more sherry cask, you know, <laughs> you're not going to get a great deal of distillery character in, in that way. But anyway, still, yeah, quality, can't complain about it. And the Port Charlotte, well, yeah, always uh, always a big, 
a big uh, uh, a big seller as far as I'm concerned. Certainly, as a, as a whiskey, I like to, I like to sell. Um, if uh, if customers are after a peated malt because it just has a lovely dimension to it. It's not just all about the peat. Um, there's some lovely barley characters, some succulent fruit, and you know quality beneath all the peat. And again, it's you know it's not a huge peat monster. A lot of people sort of look at it and go, oh, heavily peated. Mm, mm. Um, but the reality is, <laughs> to me, it doesn't seem heavily peated. It's all really quite balanced. Um, and I suppose it's because Octomore has kind of skewed the whole sort of what is heavily peated or the meaning of heavily peated. Um, but either way, still an absolutely fabulous whiskey. So, so that's this week's episode of the show in the bag. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, like I said, another big thank you to Remy Contro for the samples. Um, and um, well, not really an awful lot less to say apart from good afternoon and good ramming. <laughs>